So tell me a little bit about what the message would be that you guys would like to communicate to people watching so we make sure we hit it. Don't worry. Well, go do things. That's kind of my thing don't too. Worry, it's like don't let fear stop you from doing stuff. Yes. Don't but let have the, the fear preparation stop you. and and have the confidence and uh, and the smarts to be able to go out and do without fear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally appropriate. Yeah. Might get some dates. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go ahead and, and kick it off. Uh, this is Jamie here with Enigmatic Nomadics. And I've got three ladies with me that all live the nomadic traveling lifestyle and we're going to talk about why they chose to live this way and basically the topic of the conversation is going to be safety but we're going to talk about other things too. And so just starting from the left to right we've got Tamara, Cami, and Tisha. And starting with Tamara, tell us a little bit about how you do this, why you decided to do it, what you're do how you're traveling, how you like it. So I've lived a pretty unconventional life for the last 10 years. Every it's kind of been building up to this. And this is the kind of thing that I would fantasize about and I'd be, you know, oh I wish I could do that, you know. And um, I uh, hurt myself so I had to get an office job. I didn't have to, but I took an office job working in the adoption field and working full time in an office and doing something I was passionate about, but even so it's just such an imbalanced life, you know. Uh, it's such a slavery, spending the the vast majority of your waking hours looking at a screen, sitting in a box without any windows, and my vision suffered, my back suffered, I was depressed, I was lonely, and it just com you know gave me more conviction of what I always knew, that that's not what I was created to do. And so when my uh, when I was blessed to have my department outsourced, I, that was my cue to leave, and I just wanted to do the opposite thing. And uh, I'd been, you know, reforming from having over 200 pairs of shoes and a major shopping habit <laughs> and just terrible uh, material dependencies. And for over 10 years, I'd been kind of becoming more and more towards minimalism and really just this last purge. You know, I quit my job. I got rid of everything I owned. I packed up the car and I hit the road. And I was thinking, I'm going to do this for four months till I find, you know, my next permanent, you know, situation. Not permanent, but my next... Um, situation and um, but at the end of four months there was no reason to stop you know and uh, if you're if you got rent to pay then you got to go to work every day and uh, it's just somewhere to keep your stuff and I didn't have any stuff anymore so I had no reason to stop traveling um, if I would have known I was gonna do this for the last 14 months I probably would have started off with something a little more uh, roomy than a Kia Rio uh, I'm in a little four-door, uh, I would call it a compact car. Yeah. Um, and so, and I've got Tell a car. sleep. <laughs> oh, so when I, so when I sleep in the car, I put, I have uh, bags of clothes packed down the center of the car, put my feet on the dash, put the front seats forward, and just sleep down the middle of the car. <laughs> how she does it. That's it how works I get it. pretty <laughs> well. So I, you do you know, like turn the radio off when you're ready to sleep with your foot? I do use my feet. Yes, I do. For like, you know, whatever. You know, oh, I need to roll down the window a little bit. You know, yeah. whatever. So, uh, but it works. You make do with what you've got, and it gives you just great perspective. And I don't feel like I'm living a life of deprivation or neglect. You know, I'm certainly not in the lap of luxury, but I dress up. But I'm I'm happy. My needs are met. I'm com I'm comfortable. And how far in are you? So I've been, uh, I've, I've done this before for, for like three months, you know, in, in varying degrees of, uh, you know, whatever. But I've, uh, this time I've been out for 14 months. I've been in, living in my Kia Rio for 14 months. I've had a couple of house sitting gigs, which has really, you know, helped out. It's nice sometimes to have a kitchen, so. And Cammie, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your story. Um, okay, uh, let's see. I lived in Taiwan for seven years, um, and I think anytime you live in another country, your ideas about what you need to survive every day and live every day and living standards, uh, they change a lot. Your, your mind gets more flexible. So anyways, I was finally getting to the point where I wanted to come back from Taiwan, but I, when I went to Taiwan, I escaped this, this lifestyle of like nine to five and, and just having to work so hard to pay rent and everything like that. And so I didn't want to come back and downgrade my life by having to sit in an office or something like that. So I hit on the idea of tiny houses and that kind of morphed into van dwelling um, because there's a lot more freedom in it than hauling around a big tiny house that looks like a house and people know you're sleeping there. And so when I was planning to come home, I decided I was going to um, convert a, a little short bus schoolie. 
So I came home from Taiwan and I used all my savings to kind of convert this short bus. I also had to, Trisha, come here. The dog's crazy. Um, I also had uh, two friends coming from Taiwan and I wanted to show them my country because they'd shown me theirs. Um, but unfortunately, when I was going to pick them up from the airport, the bus completely broke down and the engine was like killed and I had like no money left and uh, except for the trip. So I took a trip with those friends and then when I came back I had maybe like 3,000 bucks and my friend's dad sold me the van I'm in now. So yeah. It's a great van. I love it. I love it. He offered it to me before I bought the bus and I wish I would have taken it. <laughs> and what is it? Um, it's a big high top van. It was used for non-emergency medical transport. So it's got a big roof like I can, it's probably about a foot above my head. After I went on this trip with my friends in a rental car and staying in hotels, it made me even more passionate about having a free lifestyle in a van. So after that, I worked up in the uh, Santa Cruz mountains teaching outdoor survival skills and I stayed in my van and I would just cruise on my weeks off or whatever. I would cruise up and down the coast on the one and it is so beautiful and so amazing. And I just thought, if you wanna live on the coast, you have to work all the time if you're not independently wealthy somehow. Mm -hmm. So if you love the ocean, you have to work all the time and then you can't even enjoy the house you're, you're living in, right? Right. So if I can live in a van and enjoy the, work, the ocean and not work all the time, then that's the perfect lifestyle for me. And I love the desert and I love being able to go back and see family and go wherever I want to go. It's, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't sure how I would like it and I love it. So I don't, I don't see myself going back to a house. I think it's great to show that women are doing this and young women yeah. too. Yes. We're relatively yes. young. Well, yes. thank you for agreeing to talk <laughs> about it then. <laughs> yeah. Tisha, tell us a little bit about how you got into this lifestyle? What was the thought process that that uh, helped you make the transition from a <laughs> conventional lifestyle to what you're doing now? Um, so the first time I did it, it was, uh, I had no choice really. I was living with a family and the family was amazing. And then they had uh, one of their sons move in because he was getting a divorce and stuff. And in that process, he uh, started threatening me and so it became a dangerous situation and I had to leave. Um, and I didn't have the money to get an apartment at the time. I didn't have anywhere to go because I'd, I'd been doing in-home healthcare work for that family and that was my job for in exchange for rent. So I had no work history. And um, so uh, I just uh, lived in my car. It was a Honda Civic, cute little tiny vehicle you know what I mean I love uh -huh. the tiny vehicle uh -huh. <laughs> um, and I loved every bit about it um, like I was really worried about it at first I didn't tell anybody nobody knew <laughs> my family didn't know didn't say anything I was working at Disney at the time and didn't even say anything at work you know um, and uh, so I just did it and I found out that I could do it and still and not you know hit that cliche homelessness look you know I was so nervous that people would find out at first and then I was like you know this really it's just like living in a house except you're mobile and um, and I have a, a disability called agoraphobia it's for it's kind of like those people who uh, who are afraid of leaving their homes they're afraid of leaving their apartments they get stuck and uh, and when I transitioned into the car, I didn't realize it at the time, but almost all of my agoraphobia symptoms went away. And then uh, I did that for five months. And at the end of the five months, my boyfriend at the time was pressuring me. I want you to get back into an apartment. I worry about you being homeless, you know. And uh, I mean, in retrospect, he had nothing to worry about. But, uh, you know, people are concerned. Um, and so I got back into an apartment for him and uh, it was just downhill from there. I was miserable. All my agoraphobia symptoms came back and like I literally thought I was cured of my disability. I didn't even think about why it was effective. 
And so ever since then, I wanted to do this again. And like when I lived in the Honda Civic, the only thing that I felt like that I was missing was uh, a bed and a fridge. And so I said to myself, this time I'm gonna look for a vehicle that has either a bed or a fridge, one of the two, and then I'll figure out the rest out from there. And I got the van with the bed. So it's mm -hmm. very large for me. It's actually bigger than I expected. And doing this again has freed me again from the agoraphobia symptoms. And it's because like people with agoraphobia have uh, their issues. They don't wanna leave a certain safe zone and that safe zone becomes your apartment or your house and that's a stationary thing but for me my safe zone my home is my car and i can take that anywhere i want and if i am in an uncomfortable situation i can leave at any moment and if i'm at a friend's house my house my home is right outside the door or it's a block away it's never very far and that's that's what i love about this life that's why i got into it is because of my disability. So I found the vehicle uh, looking on the classified ads and um, I had specific requirements when I was looking for it. It's gotta be a Chevy because that's what I know best is Chevy's and uh, so that I can repair it if there's issues. And then uh, it's gotta have either the bed or the fridge thing. And fortunately, it was literally the second van I looked at and I'm like, oh my God, this is perfect. And they were selling it for 2000. I talked them down to about 1700. And so I got a really good deal on the vehicle and, uh, and I'm really happy with it. It seems that you all three are too young to be on say, drawing social security or <laughs> retired from a, you know, job where there would be a pension. <laughs> Tisha, how would you support yourself on the road? How is it that you put gas in your van and pay for your supplies? And how do you do this for people that may be watching thinking, I want to do this, but I've got this I job that I go to every day. And if I don't have that job, yeah. uh, you know, how do I pay for supplies and things? I do get social security every month. So I know no matter what happens, I'm always going to have that backup. And that's great. Like if you're retired and, and you've got a monthly income, no matter what you do, you know you're always going to have that backup. So that's why I think why a lot of people who retire do this because it's what they've always wanted to do, you know. But for me, um, I do have other sources of income if I uh, am capable of working that month. I do have. I struggle a lot with it sometimes because I have regular panic attacks. You okay? Sorry. You're that's able free. to supplement your income through online sources yeah so i uh i'm an artist i do a lot of freelance work you are able to be on the road even with a condition like agoraphobia i think that's so yeah. cool and that like, yeah. it actually makes it better for me it it helps my disability being on the road versus and, and a lot of people who are homeless do that for the very same reason i've met quite a few people with disabilities who say on, when I'm out here on the road, I have so much more freedom and especially financially, they're collecting the disability. It's barely enough to cover rent, you know? And you've got so many other things. You've got medical expenses, you've got, like for me, I've got my service dog and she's got expenses and she, you know, the vet and everything and then the training. And I, it's just not enough money uh, to have an apartment and still be able to do everything that you need. Um, but I do do the artwork sometimes. Digitalnomads.com would be one website where folks could go and look at jobs that match with their skill set. Another one would be Fiverr, where folks can yeah, go and see. I've used and Fiverr see. for my freelance work, actually. So. And there's Elance, which is a freelance website where you put your skill set out. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I yeah, signed up for fun. that, but never had to use it, <laughs> luckily. And then, like, I do game design and stuff, so I do a lot of 3D artwork. There's also a lot of websites where you can just make stock 3D um, assets and stuff. And there's, it's, one's called Turbo Squid. There, there are a couple of really good websites where you can just build art assets for game designers or filmmakers. And when I did work at Disney, we, I worked in the art outsourcing department, and they would occasionally use uh, stock work that they would find on these these sites and so 
don't think that, oh, doing stock photography or whatever, you don't earn money that way. Well, if you're not advertising yourself, right? Yeah, you're not gonna earn money that way. It's the same as any other kind of self-business job. You've got to be the one who goes out there and, and markets. Cammy? Um, I'm an editor, so I edit academic articles for peer-reviewed journals, usually for authors who speak English as a second language, so they write it in English, but it's not standard. So I just take that and make it understandable. My job is just to ease the burden on the reader so they can get what's going on. Sometimes it's like scientists who just aren't good at communicating their ideas well. Um, and then my other job is with a Swiss think tank. I take long-form journalism and I summarize it into two-page things so that you know these really busy people can don't have to read the whole article. Um, actually, I work for two Swiss companies. And you're able to do your work from your laptop as long as yeah. you have a Wi-Fi connection? Well, actually, what I love about my work that's different from most online work is I only need that Wi-Fi connection for about two minutes to uh, download the papers and then I can go somewhere else to do the work and then I need it for another two minutes to you know send the papers back. So that's a great point. You could download all your work, go off to a remote location, get up, do your morning yoga, meditation, mm -hmm. make yourself your, your cup of tea, get in your zen, do whatever work you feel like doing that day and then just hit a place later down the road without even having an air card. You could yeah. upload it at a library or a coffee shop. And actually, I, I can even tether my phone, so that's pretty, it's it's worked great. Um, and if it's text, it's not that much data anyway, yeah? Yeah, it's just yeah, like Word documents. The other thing that I love is that if I don't want to work for a week or two weeks or a month or whatever, I can just tell my bosses, hey, I'm not going to be available for mm -hmm. this amount of time. And to me, that freedom is everything because I can go down to Mexico, you know, I can go, I often spend time on roads where there's no internet access and yeah, I don't worry at all. Like <laughs> I can just tell my boss I can't work that time. Although I am pretty broke right now due to the uh, bus blowing up and everything, but I think I'm going to build back up and I'll be fine. Sure. And I, I also think a running theme living out here this way is that it really doesn't cost that much to get, get up in the morning when you live in a van. You don't have a lot of overhead that you've got to worry so about. True. So true. And, and you're saving so much money on rent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like going from $800 a month for rent alone down to like 450 for everything or even less. Some people yeah. only yeah. live off of like maybe $150, well, $200 because they make it work. They're so frugal. Also, you don't, don't buy much. stuff because you got nowhere to put it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. That's a great point. Like yeah. even small things. <laughs> like at this point, like I, I think about it before I buy a like I've never bought a pen, pens are everywhere. But like, for instance, a small thing like that, I'm like, everything I purchase, I like really think about it. I'm like, do I really need this? Because yep. yeah. you just get allergic to clutter when you're in that small of a space. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I would agree. <laughs> and that was another thing I want to wanted to bring up. Uh, let's go ahead Can and- Can I talk about how I make my money? Yeah, let's go ahead and talk <laughs> about how you make your money and then we'll all kind of confer on what, if somebody's watching and considering what it might cost them, what that would cost we'll come to that after let's hear how you uh okay keep going out here so uh it doesn't take much gas money food uh i i'm on my a family plan for my phone my uh auto insurance is cheap and pretty much those are my only expenses um i know how to eat real cheap and um and i get good gas mileage because i'm in a, a little car um so i I've, i fortunately don't I have to work very much but uh, when I'm out of money though, um, there's a company in southern Utah that uh, lets me come work as a backcountry guide. And um, I can work as a backcountry guide for this company in southern Utah. They let me just drop in and work whenever I, whenever I want, which is a huge blessing. Is and it year round? They go year round, yeah. We take out young adults and adolescents in crisis, take them into the backcountry and kind of have this primitive experience and it's you know therapeutic for them and for us. And uh, also I work for California Survival School whenever they have work for me, which is mostly in the summer, but here and there they have classes that I can help um, instruct. So I'm really fortunate that I can do what I love and that I don't have to do very much of it. Well, I've heard you mention a few times around about the survival uh, company 
And uh -huh. how did you get interested in that? You know, it's the craziest thing. I had no interest in the natural <laughs> world whatsoever. Like I said, I had a shopping habit. I had over 200 pairs of shoes. I was working in the beauty industry. I hated hiking. I hated camping. I'd never been backpacking. I just, I was depressed and self-absorbed, which usually goes, self, you know, hand in hand. Yes. And, um, and really just my path, whatever your belief is, I, I'm just going to go ahead and use the generic God because that's what I call it. Um, but just really aggressively led me in the direction of what I didn't know I needed. And uh, once I got, you know, and led me to this company, the Anasazi Foundation, which is a wilderness therapy company. And I was compelled to go do this job that I had no interest in doing and was terrified of. And once I had this intimate connection and this intimate relationship with the natural world, I realized I had deficiencies that I wasn't even aware of. And it was just balancing me out. It was fixing all the things that people go and medicate for, you know. Um, and uh, it, was, it was just allowing me to be me and allowing me to, to be happier than I'd been. And anyway, so it's kind of just blossomed. I, got, I thought it would be a one and done. You know, I'd be like, this will change me and then I'll go back to my life and I'll be better. But like, it's, when, when you know too much, it's really hard to go back to conventional life when you've I lived something higher. I hope that doesn't sound snobby, but like for me, it was just healthier and higher, you know? And so it was just really hard to try to go back to conventional life. And I've tried once or twice, but I hear the call of the wild. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, technology and civilization and society, those are not bad things, um, but it's really empowering and liberating to know you don't need it. Right. You know, like it's bonus, but how free am I if I don't need it? And I can get by with a knife in a canteen and I can, you know, I can improvise those from natural materials in a pinch, you know, so I don't need anything that mother nature can't provide and that isn't, you know, in the hearts of the people around me. Mm -hmm. That's all I need. So it's, it's, it's been something, it's become something I need to do, you know, so. And also I'm fortunate too because um, I do a lot of adoption advocacy and most of it is volunteer work, but there are a couple of um, websites who pay me to write articles about adoption. I'm pretty lazy so I don't do it very often. But. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, so whatever your skill is, whatever your thing is, you can usually turn it into a way to get your gas money, so. Yeah. I guess I should <laughs> mention too that I also work for Outdoor Survival School and that's how we met. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you three don't travel together. Kimmy and do I. Sometimes. Don't yeah. Together sometimes. <laughs> yeah, kind but of, we now we might our, with Tisha. That yeah. <laughs> now that we yeah. met. Well, and that's how this works. You make connections with other people who are on your same wavelength, you know, and then because it is safer in numbers, it is safer yes. to have people, especially yes. who know where you are, but who are with you as a woman. And so it's nice when you can make connections with other women who are kind of doing the same thing and have the same interest. And I say, hey, Cammy, let's go to Mexico. Or, yeah. she, or she says, hey, Tamara, let's go out to like have a sue to this uh, build out thing <laughs> that this so guy Jane is doing. Right. You know? yeah. So we kind of, you know, come together and then go do our own thing and come together and do our own thing, which, which is really perfect. nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For folks watching, wondering how much of a budget they need every month to be able to do this, to be able to live on the road, the traveling lifestyle, what would be you guys' answers off the cuff? Everybody's situation is going to be different. Folks are going to have separate needs and special considerations. But for the most part, give us an idea of what it costs to live out here like this. I could do it on 400 a 400 month. Yeah. My finances are chaos. I have no idea, but probably around there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to make a thousand so I can save. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have a future where we might not be able to work. Who knows? So mm -hmm. in, a, in like a year's, I, I added it all up after my first year of travel. In a year's time, I had worked ten weeks and made less than nine thousand yeah. so, <laughs> dollars. Yeah. And then with a, with a the surplus, part. yeah. Yeah, with with a surplus, I didn't I didn't use all of that either. So like, and I went to Europe for three months, and I went backpacking in Mexico, and I went to Fiji. So. Can't beat that. Yeah, I mean, if you're smart, <laughs> if you put the if you put the uh, homework into being frugal, I was raised by the two cheapest people on the planet, so yeah. like, I've, it's a science. Being cheap is, you know, <laughs> and it's not. It's not. I never feel like I'm not getting something that I want. Yeah, you're never <laughs> lacking. Just, yeah, well, and part of it is I just don't want a lot of crap. Like, I mean, not to quote Fight Club or anything, <laughs> but the stuff you own starts owning you, it's and so I just true. I don't know, like. When I have too much stuff, it weighs on me. It's burdensome. Like, em mentally and emotionally. It so. makes me feel cluttered on the inside. Yep. So I don't, and I never feel like I'm And there's the stress of cleaning it up, and then you get that procrastination, and that's like an extra heavy weight, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Like keeping definitely. everything looking nice. Some people know. manage it, but I don't have the brain for it. I don't it. know how they do it, yeah. What would you say, Tish? Monthly expenses, um, what could you get by on if you had to? About $450 a month is what I spend on all my basic expenses, but there are quite a few things in that list that I don't 
even really need to be spending money on. So I currently have a uh, an internet connection with Xfinity, and mm -hmm. it's uh, seventy dollars a month. And uh, I just I pay for it, and I have a friend who they have the the box, and so they use the internet, the ground internet, and that allows me to use um, the Xfinity Wi-Fi, which is a network that I use. Um, but they're not available everywhere, and so I've been considering doing a different thing. I hear Verizon's really good, um, but uh, something like that. Technically, I don't really need it. I could just just use the Wi-Fi, but mm -hmm. you know, go to McDonald's or Starbucks or something. Mm -hmm. But um, I I really like being able to have a little bit more privacy when I'm online and gaming or working and that kind of thing so yeah so a baseline four hundred and fifty dollars and then anything over that just gives you a larger fuel budget yeah. or to fix a flat tire or anything that might happen right. mechanically right <laughs> but, but at happen. the same time i'm an urban dweller so i stick to the city i don't drive very much you know whereas i was watching somebody i can't remember who it was but uh one of their youtube channel youtube youtube channels and they s mentioned that they spend about six hundred dollars a month on gas i'm like holy shit where are you going you know like right. and so if you're the kind of person that's just doing this to travel you're going to spend a lot more money unless you're in a key area unless you're in a key area or a honda civic yeah honda civic's 32 miles a gallon <laughs> it's pretty good stuff yeah so let's talk safety three young beautiful girls concerned about <laughs> you know running yes. into bad situations first let me just ask you all since you've been doing this have you had any bad experiences that you would that you would uh, claim that you would classify as kind of your worst nightmares manifested has anything like that happened no no nope. yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, this variety yes yeah. <laughs> tell us about oh it. golly so the first time I ever went homeless I did it for about two weeks this was ages ago because I wanted to see if it was something safe that I could do and um, my boyfriend at the time he had a dog and I didn't have a dog at the time and he's like I want you to take my dog just in case you know I, it's really important that you know I want you to be safe while you're doing this experiment testing out the waters you know and so I I had no clue where to park, what was the safest area to be. That's like something you really learn when you get into it because people talk about street smarts, you know, but they don't realize street smart, it's very literal. So you know what on that street is happening on that street, how those people behave, uh, what they think of you and being able to recognize those things, the signs of danger, the signs of a, a lot of local gangs, or the signs of a too rich neighborhood that's gonna call the cops on you the moment they see you, and that kind of thing. That's street smarts. Whereas a lot of people are like, oh, I'm street smart, I know my way around the town. No, 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 you don't know your way around yeah, the town. At night. <laughs> so uh, definitely do a lot of scouting before you get into it. Um, but so yeah, the first week I did it, I, I think it was the very first day, actually. I, I leaned back in my, uh, in my chair to go to bed and I just kind of laid there for a bit, not able to sleep. And then uh, this guy, scary, big bushy beard, completely raggedy and, and unbathed and everything, comes up to my window, bangs on my window, open the door! <laughs> open the door <laughs> and he just keeps doing that and um and my dog next to me he he freaks out starts barking ooh, 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 and the guy kind of you know gets scared and runs off and you know and uh i think having a having a dog just in general is a great mm, deterrent yes it's so yeah. much safer doing this with a dog um and i i don't think i've met very many women who do this without dogs you're I did have the cat though. Sure. <laughs> You're a yeah. cat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she but, has very sharp claws. 
but just seeing the dog like my dog's not aggressive but she looks like a wolf and so sometimes just seeing that uh -huh. makes people nervous but yeah that was one of that I mean day one my worst fear happened uh -huh. you know and and I didn't give up on it I kept doing it for the two full two weeks and then you know found better living arrangements but um, you know you got to be prepared for that kind of thing and and i do have a lot of other stories but i'm gonna save that for your what's your funniest story okay question. what uh did you do in that situation you saw the guy run off and did you start yeah. the engine and drive to another location no um so after that event i talked to my psychologist because i i told him i'm like i was frozen i didn't know what to do because the first time you're presented with this kind of thing you you are you don't know what to do you don't know you know, and then you think of all the never things. Had Why didn't this I do issue this? Before? Why didn't I do that? Yeah, after the, the fact. Um, and so one of the things that week I talked to my psychologist about, and he, he said, um, "Have your keys there." You know, your yeah. Yeah, we can wait for that. Let me check and make sure that we're still good on all of our batteries. Hello. Very weird. No, I think it looks good. Yeah, it looks good. No, I'm trying to get some distance. You look gorgeous every you day. Do. I have no you idea do. how you do it. <laughs> are you kidding me? No. <laughs> no. You are great. great. Well, I was going to bring that up too at some point that you, every time I've seen you, you don't look like you're a survivalist out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just got like, out of your car. I get that a lot. I'm the unlikely survivalist. I have set, definitely retained some of my vanity, though it's very, yeah. really modified. Like, I don't know when the last time I, you know, I shave my legs when I feel like it, when it's yeah. convenient, you know, so I'm somewhere in between, but. Yeah. Well, I think that, that uh, <coughs> you guys and videos like this for people to see is a catalyst for a paradigm shift because totally. there's a. There's you don't have to be a specific thought. kind of person. Yeah. Yeah. So you went ahead, you talked to your psychologist oh, afterwards. Yeah. So I, I talked to my psychologist and we made a safety plan, basically. Uh, <laughs> what I'm gonna do if that ever happens to me again. Um, and basically always have your keys within arm's reach uh, so that you can press the alarm. And don't move, don't let them know that there's somebody in the vehicle if they haven't noticed or if they're just kind of dicking around and making noise and stuff. Don't show that there there's someone in the vehicle or you might be more likely to be a target. And then just press that, that alarm button and they don't know the difference of whether they might have accidentally kicked it or got too close or something. And the alarm will usually frighten them off from the noise. Um, and then he also suggested I get some mace, which I did do. But then I maced myself with it three times <laughs> in a row. And so uh, I got rid of the mace. I do have a tiny little bottom bottle now, but it's like in a hidden corner that's very difficult to reach simply because, you know, I don't want to blind myself. But, um, and so the mace was good, but uh, call the police. Like I have all of the dispatch numbers of every uh, city that I live in on speed dial and so if I have an issue and I'm worried I can at least call dispatch and say there's this guy creeping around this area this neighborhood I'm a little nervous come check it out you know what I mean and uh, and all those things but then when it happened to me again later in the future uh, turns out I didn't even react the way that we had planned to you know all this planning of uh, prepping to be safe and uh, when you get into the situation it's, you, you don't react the same way you would expect to you know but yeah uh, now I'm just so everything happened that's okay <laughs> so everything worked out okay it was a scary moment you got a, a knock on the, the window mm -hmm. scary guy scary moment everything worked out okay mm -hmm. And do you feel like that's, you don't feel like that's something that's going to keep you from living this way? No, I mean, um, well, at the time, like, like I said, I, I had to, like it was, uh, I didn't have very many options. So I know, I, like I was only homeless for that two weeks, that very first time. The second time was like five months, but that very first time 
again, it was the same situation. I had no job. I had no apartment, no money, you know, no way of surviving. And uh, so I, I wasn't going to give up on it, but I did look for other options after that experience, which is why I only did it for two weeks. I just called in favors from all of my friends, you know, hey, right. do you know somebody? <laughs> What, what's, you know, how can I get into a place, but... Um, well, do you consider yourself homeless now? I still enjoyed it. I do consider myself homeless, but I don't consider myself homeless. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, in, in our uh, in our language, in English, there's without a house, and then there's homeless. And, like... And houseless. Houseless <laughs> versus homeless, exactly. And so... Um, no, I don't have a house, so that makes me homeless statistically. Um, but I have a home, and I have a safe place, and I have a community. I think in terms of like um, stop, stopping this lifestyle because of something dangerous happening, I mean, I've had dangerous things happen in a house. Right. You know, I've had people, I've had, I've literally had a man break into my house, a stranger attack my roommate, you know, and so I feel like, what are you going to build a fortress? Yeah, you know, like <laughs> live like a lame life. Yeah, <laughs> right. We can't live, you know, under our kitchen tables, it's hoping no for the best. Yeah, nothing ventured, nothing gained. What safety measures do you take, Tamara? Um, you know, not many. I guess um, my mm -hmm. philosophy is I trust everyone in public in the daylight and trust no man at night alone. Mm -hmm. You know. And um, I'm not concerned about protecting my stuff very much. I mean, I spent a year with everything I own in my car and rarely locking the doors and leaving the windows down. And I just figure like, people are gonna know that if I leave my stuff that vulnerable, they don't probably want it. And I have nothing of mon monetary value anyway. And, um, and nothing that can't be replaced and very, very little that I'm attached to. Ironically, I, after a year, I did get my car broken into and they took the one thing that did mean something to me that it would mean nothing to them. Um, and it was when I locked my doors, so they broke the window. I never locked my doors. So, uh, yeah, irony. Um, I'm much more concerned about protecting my person than my stuff. Right. Um, so, um, you know, just being smart about where you park. Um, you know, Walmart parking lots are generally a very safe place to sleep. I don't do it very often because it's bright lights and whatever. Wow. You know. The ones I'm talking about are the ones that go to the Walmart parking lot and they don't take care of their stuff. They don't leave it better than it is than it was when they arrived right. you know what oh, I mean? sure, yeah. those are the kind of dangerous ones that you want to avoid and so sometimes uh sleeping with the community is more dangerous as a woman yeah. mm. i don't so generally go, I, with, I don't want anybody yeah. to uh, there. sleeping with a female community exclusive yeah that's that's you know yeah you know i generally I mean? so don't I would, do the parking lot i would lot totally thing. do the mm. a caravan with you too yeah, yeah. you know if you wanted to so but I don't do the parking Wait, lot do, thing with the... I want to talk Walmart. about my one weird Walmart experience. Because I've had great experiences there. Uh -huh. Well, can you tell us what uh, you do for safety? And we'll uh, oh. have all of you guys... Like, what do you... Oh, I thought we were sharing take? experience. Okay. Oh, we yeah. will talk Sorry. about that. Uh, what do I do? Um, I always walk my dog about five minutes away from where I'm planning to park for the night. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people don't make that connection. Oh, she got in her van and never left. Uh -huh. And then I usually park kind of close to the store. It's louder. That sucks, but I feel a lot safer. Uh -huh. um, I'll tell you about the one time I didn't park close to the store. And let's see, what else do I do? Yeah, I'm mostly just careful about when people see me get out. And do you get carry in. mace? I have mace. I also have a Glock and an AR in my van at all times. So me you too. Carry don't a we handgun. all? Don't we all? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Um, I had a taser. My brother-in-law let me borrow his taser, and I might get another one of those. It had distance, and it can drop a bolt. So that's I usually good. have. I usually have my knife I have on my, my knife. hip or close yeah. by, and just because. I mean, I don't. I have it. I have it because I use it for carving. I use it for my livelihood of doing um, outdoor living stuff. But also, it's great for safety. If I'm in my sleeping bag, it's in there with me, um, and so that's smart. But I like. <laughs> I like to park in nice neighborhoods because my car um, doesn't look like I live in it. I mean, if someone looks closer, they'll see me yeah. in there because the windows aren't tinted or anything. So I like to go to like 
fairly nice neighborhoods, not the ones who are gonna call the cops on you. And I don't, I, if there's some bushes in front of someone's house, I'll park in front yeah. of those bushes. You or know, there's just little things, you know. Or you get a wall between two houses, you park between two houses. <laughs> exactly. And then this house thinks you're yep. with them, and that yep. house thinks exactly. you're with them. Exactly. That's a great tip, I do yes. the same thing. I yes. did that in the Pacific Palisades for two weeks with my van. Yeah. yeah. That but I'm, I'm road tripping a lot, so I I do sleep on just freeway exits yeah. a lot. You know, just I rest yeah, stops. I'll, yeah. I don't I don't sleep in rest stops very often. I'll I'll sometimes try to drive around and find some place that maybe no one's gonna go. You know, just find some little dirt road somewhere that no one's gonna go. Oh, sorry. Pros and cons to that. You know what I mean? Some it's unlikely you'll be found, but if you are, you know, if you're found by a bad guy, you won't be found by anyone else for a while. But mm. you know. So, and also just the stuff that we learned growing up, like be super aggressive if, if people are freaking yes. you out. Yep. You know, I, I mean, I haven't had my worst nightmare. I haven't had mm -hmm. someone banging on the window saying, let me in, but I've encountered definitely people who with ill intent, mm -hmm. such a thing as bad guys. And definitely you encounter men who are like, hmm, you're vulnerable. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like your, your lifestyle, you know, might be something they, that I could pray on or. They think that, uh. So there's kind of a stigma with being homeless. They think that that makes you weak somehow. Yeah. It for a lot of people, it's not a choice, and they're suffering. And because they're yeah. suffering, that makes you a target. And so the stigma of homelessness is almost more dangerous than the actual experience. Yeah. You know. But I I am super confident with folks who I feel like might think they might be able to take advantage and generally they're bullies and they're wimps yeah. anyways and so they back yeah. down. No matter, what your, no matter yeah. Yeah. what your yeah. philosophy and personal feelings are about cops or bad cops like in the situation being adversarial is just going to make it harder yep. on you yes. unfortunately yep. like I'm not I, like I want to make my point but I also want to go on my merry way we just want to go on our way and if they're yeah. being like, adversarial you have to flip the script yeah you have to say something yeah. nice and you or can. just kind of get them a little off balance yes. and then they're like oh human human totally cool. and they like, and then <laughs> they switch gears when you when they realize yeah. like Hey, I'm yeah. not a problem for you. And, and, well, there's definitely privilege, privilege yeah. also in that people don't find us very intimidating. Yes. That too. Like, I've been stopped I by a cop the in a neighborhood who woke me up, and when I popped up in the window, immediate big smile breaks out. Oh, you sleep in here? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Well, here's where you can sleep safely. Mm -hmm. And I think if I was a dude, he probably wouldn't have been right. quite as nice to right. me. And people know? want to help you. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. It's funny there's because- There's privilege, for sure. There is. Like, the other day, I got something worked on for free on my car because they saw that everything I owned was in there, and they're like, what's your address? And I was like, I don't have one. And so they, yeah. you know, they did the work, and they're like, no charge. Well, I, I think that we take the good with the bad. There's also situations that come up where you come out a little worse than maybe you could have. And yeah, so we just got to take the good with the bad. Cammie, you had a story that you wanted to share about Walmart. <laughs> yeah. I think it was my second night sleeping in the van, and I was very nervous. Like, I was texting with friends the, the whole time. The first night is the worst. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing? But I had parked far away because, I don't know, I thought it would be darker and quieter and everything. And... I woke up maybe like two or three in the morning and there was a guy rapping. First I thought it was the radio, but then <laughs> it was just this guy rapping. And oh, I was in my school bus then. And he's just rapping and walking, literally doing laps around my bus. And I'm like, does he know I'm in here? It's, and so I'm like, well, he's pretty good. So <laughs> the rap sounds good. I'm like, I'm just gonna see how this plays out. And so I just laid there and kind of like drifted off to him rapping and it was about an hour and a half and finally he just walked away. Okay. Wow. And that was in Walmart. That was at Walmart, the Walmart parking lot, but far out. Another time I was in a Denny's parking lot and maybe three or four in the morning, there was this guy just shouting pretty close, but it just sounded, I couldn't make out the words, but it just sounded like this amazing orator like he, he just sounded like a man who'd been wronged I didn't know what he was shouting about but it went on for like an hour and I was just like people don't even know that this is the kind of thing that goes on after yeah. hours huh. in the Denny's parking you find lot out so much uh -huh. about, about the world and about the and what city. they do uh -huh. <laughs> but he sounded so like dignified and it was like something you'd expect to hear in a movie I was like damn dude you lost your calling. Like you should be a it voice was, actor. It was so dramatic and perfect. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. 
But then I started hearing things getting smashed and it was coming progressively closer and I knew no, it was him and I was like, yeah. uh -huh. all right, that's where the keys come in yeah, handy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm well, leaving. Well, Cammy said something that reminded me of something that I like to do uh, for safety, which is um, let people know where you are. So I text, you know uh, what I mean? My like mom, if I'm gonna yeah. stop for a at a particular location and sleep, I'll text people and say I'm sleeping. I'll, I'll drop a pin, you know, so that people know where I was sleeping. Yep. Um, or, you know, I'll let people know where I'm in route from and to just so there's a, you know, a trail of me in case I... Sure. And I say, Flight plan. I mm -hmm. will text you at this time. If I don't text at this time, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. with my mom or and my she, brother. You texted and they're me very once and you're like, I met some dude. This is the description of his yeah. vehicle or whatever. I do that you know, with like, every He didn't come in the van. <laughs> he he <laughs> date, camped so outside. That, he's actually a real good friend now. That's funny. Cool. Very, very yeah. cool guy. Again, yeah. nothing but your nothing Shout game, out but Jeremy. Take, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> but you take precautions. Yeah. There are also some apps out there that you can put on your phone that uh, are designed for that reason. Designed for, such, for instance, if you were going to go on a hike by yourself, that uh, folks are notified at different uh, points along it. I think it can be set up. You decide who the people are and you decide how, how you want to notify them. And I'll put some links in for those apps if you want to put those on your phone just as an added measure of safety. Like, I, I trust my senses a lot. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I feel like nothing has ever gone awry that I didn't sense yeah. a badness, you know? And I think there are varying levels. Some men are just like mischievous, like, yeah, I'm not really, I'm not, really, I'm not into what you're into, you know? But some people have super ill intent. Mm -hmm. And I feel like my senses generally guide me pretty well on that, you know? So, uh, and I, so I kind of do default to trust, but it doesn't mean that I'm always like. So you trust your intuition. Right. Yeah. Totally. I also feel like part of preparation <laughs> is just accepting that maybe something will happen someday. Yeah. And um, and knowing that that's not going to cause me to limit my life. Because if one bad thing happens one time out of a thousand, I'm not I'm not going to ruin my whole life trying to avoid that mm -hmm. one bad thing. Mm -hmm. I agree. And also something could happen between the. <laughs> Also, something could happen between exiting the grocery store and walking to your car after dark. Yep. Mm -hmm. if, if you have a home. Yeah. Oh, if I have, have another home. situation. Okay. Where um, I accidentally, I don't know how I did this, I got the rear wheels of my van in a ditch off the road and um, I couldn't get it out. I was putting stuff under the wheels and trying to seesaw, doing all this stuff and eventually the the front tire of my van was like tilted like that and I was scared to get in because I thought I might roll it and I was like dang I was just gonna sleep in it but now I can't do anything this was on a road like in the middle of Montana <laughs> which is pretty sparsely populated anyways with I hadn't seen anybody in about four hours and I was like well all right guess I'm camping outside <laughs> but then I saw this truck approach and I just remember having this thought like this is the moment do I trust humanity or do I not? Do I go mm -hmm. hide? Or do I stand out in the middle of the road and be like, hey, help me? Mm -hmm. And I just, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go with trust. And so I stood out in the road and these two guys got out and they're like, oh, we see what you're doing. You know, super good guys. And one of them was like, I have a daughter about your age. Yeah. And when they pulled my van out, they, um, they said, come to this, you know, to our tavern that, you know, we own or whatever. Uh -huh. And I went to the tavern and, you know, it was just the cool, like it was built in 1890 and you know, all the Wyatt Earp had drunk there. And I just spent the evening talking to these salty old guys who told me all these stories. There was another woman there, which be, yeah. made me feel better. And then they said, oh, just park right here and sleep. And it was just such a great, you know, yeah. and there's, there's so many times people are good. There are bad people kind of are good. <laughs> people yes. are good, especially I, people doing this. Yeah. Like yeah. there are, I don't think I've met a single person here that wasn't trying to help yeah. everybody else with something, you know, yeah. and it's incredible. I had a paramedic, I had this horrible migraine with some stroke symptoms like a month and a half ago, it was really freaky, and called 911, which I've never done before, and um, I don't have the health insurance to take an ambulance, you know, that costs so much money and the stroke symptoms had abided but I had like I was vomiting and I had this migraine and stuff and the paramedic took me to his house and let me sleep in his kid's bed for three hours to oh like boy. isn't that incredible yeah that's like, crazy yeah because oh, otherwise awesome. I was just gonna writhe on 
the grass of this empty church house. <laughs> yeah. If you're out living in vehicles, mm -hmm. nobody really does that yet. It mm -hmm. seems like it's a movement that's kind of coming in, but it hasn't really taken hold. A lot of folks that don't do it don't understand it. Mm -hmm. What do your families <laughs> think about what you're doing? We'll start with you, Tamara. Um, a lot of people in my life are like, that would have been cute in your 20s. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like that's what your lifestyle's not really age appropriate, Tamara. Um, I think, um, you know, I think people are supportive. Like, that's really cool. You're having that adventure. Are you done? You know, like, um, <laughs> All and my call it a grand adventure. I'm like, I'm not going on a grand adventure. Like, I'm living my I'm life. Living my life. <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, but you know, generally people are supportive. But there are a lot of people in my. There are some little old ladies back home in Memphis who are like. All right, now you've had your fun. You need to settle down, be safe, and get married, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, which I, I, I don't plan on traveling forever. I, I do want to plant things and to have she roots and to homestead. have. I want a homestead. I want to have so a homestead. So, if there are life. any I wanna very have, awesome available channels, I'm yeah. Jenny. I want to make the... some babies and stuff, you mm -hmm. know, but, um, but I don't want to sit and look around and wait for, like, you know, for something to happen. You know, I want to be out living my life. What would be the climate that you would uh, prefer for homesteading? Would you want four seasons? I'm allergic to winter. <laughs> so a very mild four, or maybe two seasons, you know, works best for me. So I generally, that's a great thing about traveling too, is there are places that I love that do get winter. So I go when it's warm and I leave when it's cold. So. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, so, but there are, pe there in my, in my life, there are people who view it all different kinds of ways. And there are some people I think who are, who some are more vocal than others and less vocal than others. And some people feel like it's, it's irresponsible. And like one guy on a Facebook post said something like, okay, you just keep um, doing your thing and I'll keep working to pay for the roads that you're driving on. And I was like, good deal. Thank you. <laughs> cool. I love it. I like good that. arrangement. Um, so, you know, I get all kinds of responses to it, but generally people, I get a lot of, Oh, I wish, I wish I could do that. Mm -hmm. That's probably what I get the most of. I wish I could have that life. And I was like, yeah, I used to wish it too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I get that a lot too. <laughs> People who say, who say, oh, I wish I could do what you're doing, but you know, I have responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. like, honey, you bought that car brand new. You didn't have to do that. You, you brought that on yourself, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but mostly the people I care about, I have gotten nothing but love. Yeah. Nothing, my my 88 year old grandma just gets this big twinkly smile. It gets so excited for me. You must be having a great time. Mm -hmm. I send her postcards, she's awesome. My mom is totally supportive. My dad is, he's helping me with the van. I'm so lucky. Um, but I find that if you do some like preliminary work, that helps. So what I did was I just kept leaving the country <laughs> and they wanted me to come back. And so I, I think now, you know, they're just glad that I'm back in America. Mm. So even if I'm living in a van and yeah. acting weird and doing do something crazy really stuff, extreme and then people will be glad you're just living like, in your vehicle. Be like, <laughs> Hey dad, I'm pregnant and the father's a crack addict. Just and kidding, just I live kidding, in a I want to live in a van. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be good to go. Yeah. <laughs>